I saw something move. Wesh. Huh. I think we might have scared him off. How do you know it was an otter anyway? It might just have... Stay where you are. No, stay back. <gasps> we'd, uh... We'd better get the police. Come away. Burkitt and the Red Stains on the Carpet by Caroline and David Stafford with Neil Dudgeon as Norman Burkitt and Saga Aria as Buck Ruxton. Yes, of course, it's foolish. Ludicrous. I already said as much. Who is William Hickey? The chap in the Daily Express. Have we been introduced? I think it's a pseudonym. He didn't make the selection himself, anyway. Public personalities our readers most like reading about. Mm, mm. People wrote in. Like an election. Oh, sort of. Which, in this case, Signor Mussolini seems to have won. <laughs> People like reading about him. Not the same thing as wanting him for their duce. Greta Garbo is more popular than you. Not as good looking, though. Bernard Shaw is more popular than you. Gracie Fields is more popular than you. <laughs> And you are at number 20 level, pegging with the Aga Khan. <laughs> Sir Bernard Spilsbury, I noticed, is number 25. Next year, his people will present him with his own weight in gold. An honour really accorded to Home Office pathologists. The Aga Khan. Ah. What is it they all possess which attracts this searchlight of public interest? Is it the ability they have in the jobs they perform... Or is it because besides doing whatever they choose to do well, they do it slightly differently from the others? There is a little bit of colour about them and the way they do things. Five places above Spilsbury. Four places? No, four places. You once told me you were incapable of bearing a grudge. I don't bear him a grudge. The Mancini case was more than a year ago. Uh, it was a professional difference of opinion. You were very angry. Wait, he had the gall to produce a fragment of the victim's skull. Three days into the trial, no warning he was going to use it as significant evidence, he produced this piece of bone and insisted that the depressed fracture could only have been produced by the small end of a hammer. When it was plain as a pike staff that any one of a number of accidental causes could have caused a fracture exactly like it. And that is just the sort of so-called expert testimony that muddies the waters, making a complete and absolute travesty of the entire judicial process. It, this constant insistence on scientific authority, fingerprints and blood spatters and ballistics, and none of it's ever as certain as they like to pretend, but oh, they'll stand on their hind legs and purge themselves to perdition before they'll admit a scintilla of doubt. <coughs> oh, oh. Oh. It was never a good pourer, anyway. Well, now, this is a case to dress the shop window, just up your street, if you don't mind me saying so. Ah, I'll pass it over. 
Well-respected doctor. Ah, the Indian doctor with the improbable name. Buck Ruxton. Oh, that's right, Buck Ruxton. I read about it over breakfast. Called him the, uh, the Indian with the cowboy's name. The Times said that. The Express. The... Oh, yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Number 20. Congratulations. Do you think so? It's nice to be noticed. It demeans the dignity of the profession. Ah... Uh... It's a moot point, uh, but people like having heroes, don't they? Better a decent lawyer for a hero than a murderer or a dictator. Mm. Yeah, go on, anyway. Half-Indian doctor with a, a cowboy name in Lancaster, was it? In Lancaster. Well-respected doctor, flighty wife. Charge is that he found his wife was doing the dirty on him, so he stabs her and cuts her up. And then his maid comes in, catches him at it, so he stabs her and cuts her up too. Then he reported the missing. Brother and sister on a rambling holiday in Dumfrieshire find body parts under a bridge by a little stream. Sixty-eight separate body parts, all by the stream? Scattered all over. It's listed there. The police brought in the Boy Scouts to help do the search. At first they thought they'd got a man and a woman because they'd only found one uterus. But then the third breast turned up, making it more likely they had two women. They brought in Boy Scouts to help with this? That's right. Is there a badge of some sort? I suppose there'd be a certain amount of map reading observational skills and so forth. <clears throat> what? Good Lord. <laughs> You've come to the Cyclops Eye. The Cyclops Eye? The Cyclops Eye. I looked it up. In Homer? Black's Medical Dictionary. It's a form of maldevelopment. Rare in humans, more common in pigs, where the two eyes are fused together in the middle of the forehead. Often it's accompanied by other malformations so severe the creature almost invariably expires a few hours after birth. But they're sure that this particular eye belonged to a human. They can't say. Yet somehow the police have associated these various body parts, some of women, some possibly of pigs, found in Scotland, with the missing wife and maid of a much-respected doctor in Lancaster. Yes. And what brought them to this conclusion? Hard to say. The skulls have been scalped, there's been teeth removed, and the fingertips have been sliced away. So what, was the doctor's wife a cyclops? No. Did he keep one-eyed pigs? <laughs> Some of the body parts were wrapped in a copy of the Sunday Graphic, which contained pictures of the Morecambe Carnival, establishing that it was the Morecambe and Lancaster edition of the paper. And on the strength of this, they made an arrest. They also found bloodstains at the doctor's house. Well, he's a doctor. Patients bleed. Quite extensive bloodstains. Perhaps he's a clumsy doctor. Does he have an explanation? He says... He, well, it's all there, sir. He says he cut himself on a tin of peaches. Hmm. And is there any indication he may be lying? None at all, and there is a scar on his hand, quite livid. Anything else? The prosecution does seem to have summoned quite a weight of scientific and medical evidence. Spilsbury. Professor John Glaston. Uh, Spilsbury's terrier. Mm. I shall enjoy this. Good morning, Dr. Russell. My name's Edgar Boker, and this is Mr. Burkett, who will be defending you in court. It's an honour, Mr. Burkett. This morning I was reading off your very great triumphs in the Daily Express. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> you should be proud, Mr. Burkett. Popular claim is not to be despised. Agreed, but perhaps it feels a little uncomfortable to have one's name even incidentally associated with that of Signor Mussolini. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, please. Uh. I'm sorry, Mr. Balker, there doesn't seem to be a chair. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, did they offer you tea? No, they, they, don't, uh, they don't do that. Uh, you know, I must warn you, Mr. Burkett, before this very unfortunate business brought me such horrible notoriety, I too enjoyed a certain modest celebrity in my hometown. The perfectly humdrum application of my medical knowledge effected cures which, in a town that historically has found itself somewhat beyond the purlieu of the latest scientific research, must have seemed like miracles. Hmm. Being regarded as a miracle worker can turn the head somewhat, Mr. Burkett. It takes a certain mental discipline and self-knowledge to battle such immodesty, both virtues which I am sure you possess in full measure. Oh, <laughs> well, I think you might have to take issue with my wife on that matter, <laughs> not to mention my clerk. <laughs> oh, not at all, Mr. Burkett, not at all. Now, um, uh, Dr. Ruxton, I wonder if you'd mind if I made rather an abrupt observation. Not to put too fine a point on it, your general demeanour, to my eye, is not that of a man who has suffered a recent and monstrous bereavement, nor that of a man on trial for his life. First of all, you are mistaken in believing I have suffered a bereavement, Mr. Burkett. 
I have read the reports of the forensic pathologists, and there is barely anything in them to suggest, much less prove, that the remains found in Scotland are those of my wife and maid. Hmm. My wife and maid are alive. I don't know where they are at present residing, but I have absolutely no reason to suppose them dead. And as to your second point, how could I possibly be on trial for my life when I'm an innocent man? When my prosecutors have no evidence to suggest otherwise? And when my defense is the great Norman Burkett? Oh. <laughs> oh, could I see your hand, Mr. Bowker? What? Oh, uh, oh, it's, it's nothing. The doctor says it's a bit of psoriasis. Hmm. Does the house in which you live have perhaps a porch or a front garden planted with shrubs? Well, I don't have a house of my own. I'm in digs in Clapham. Very nice digs with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wigan, but uh, the, the house has got a porch, yes. Mm. And, and is the porch fringed delightfully with ivy? Uh, yes. And is the ivy a little overgrown, and does it tickle your hand each morning as you leave the house? Oh, you think that could be the problem? <laughs> your chemist can make this up for you. It's an ointment to reduce the swelling. Meanwhile, wearing thick gloves, cut back the ivy around your porch. Oh, thank you. It's not psoriasis, is it? <laughs> not in the slightest. Your doctor was mistaken. Excellent. If we could... My we... incarceration in this cell came about as a result of bad science, Mr. Burkett. Hmm. The good scientist observes, evolves a theory based on observation, devises a series of repeatable experiments to test the theory, and only when it is rigorously tested does he hesitantly venture to describe his theory as fact. Inspector Morrison of the Lancashire Constabulary came up with the theory that these remains were those of my wife and maid and that I was their murderer. And when the facts failed to fit his theory, rather than questioning the theory, he simply gathered more facts and wove them into ever more intricate cathedrals of conjecture. Hmm. But the fact remains that your wife is missing. My wife is an extraordinarily beautiful woman and was never blessed with the ability to remain steadfast in the face of the barrage of compliments and opportunities that came her way. But I am sure she is alive, Mr. Burkett, and has gone abroad, perhaps with a lover, taking her maid with her. I am as certain of this as Inspector Morrison is certain that those were her remains found in Scotland. But I can establish no more proof of my assumption than he of his. So here I sit, unscientifically. Sir Bernard Spilsbury and Professor Glaston... Are very bad scientists who present conjecture as fact. I think what Dr Ruxton is suggesting, Edgar, is that we have a great deal of work to do. I am then to be a law widow. I am afraid so. For a short time. It is, I think, quite unprecedented. Jackson's prosecuting, and he's called 113 witnesses, mostly, it appears, char ladies, and producing 209 separate pieces of evidence. They have a strong case. No, they have no case at all, but still, each witness must be questioned, each tedious piece of evidence discredited. His wife's adultery provides a convincing motive, but really, they have nothing else at all. But they do have such an awful lot of nothing. Trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmation strong as proofs of holy writs. Hmm. He's a half-Indian doctor married to a Scotswoman. The last thing we want at the moment is to conjure the image of Othello in the minds of the jury. But you won't be going up there before Wednesday. Wednesday. The benefit lunch for Arthur Kirkwall. Oh, hell, is that on Wednesday? No, no I, I, I'm afraid I'm doing the other thing on Wednesday. What other thing? The, um, the Daily Express thing. Which Daily Express thing? <laughs> The Daily Express has invited me to a luncheon at the Savoy with some of the other people in the, um, in the thing. <clears throat> with Signor Mussolini and the Aga Khan. Uh, with George Bernard Shaw and Gracie Fields. And why have you not mentioned this? I may have been trying to pretend it wasn't going to happen. And then off you go to Manchester to rob the gallows of its prey. What have you been reading? Nothing. Your conversation has become empurpled. <laughs> No, you're hardly late at all. 
Mr Shaw and Miss Fields have just popped outside with the photographer for a few minutes. Oh, uh, should I... Um... No, <laughs> you're all right. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, correct me if I've misunderstood, Mr Bennett. You are the gentleman who writes under the name of William Hickey. Ah, nothing nearly so grand. I'm one of the great army of nobodies, Mr Burkett. Uh, William Hickey is written by Mr Dryberg. Only he was unfortunately detained on account of being... Uh, I don't mind telling you because you're a legal man. <laughs> He's been apprehended for importuning young men. Oh, uh, oh dear. <clears throat> Is there anything I can do to help? No. Nice of you to offer, but he's quite particular about him being young. Ah. Ah, and here's Mr Shaw and Miss Fields. <laughs> I'd like you to meet Mr Burkett. Mr Burkett? How do you? Mr Shaw, Miss Fields. Gracie, call me Gracie. Mm. Miss Fields is what I do if I spend too much time in Rochdale. <laughs> that is priceless. I can see you and I are going to get on like a house on fire, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> Not we having the time of our lives. I hear you're from Alverston, Mr Burkett. Oh, that's right. You ever run into Stan Laurel? He's from up that way, isn't he? He is indeed. I'm a little bit older, of course, but my parents knew his granny Metcalf very well oh. indeed. Laurel and Hardy are priceless. Oh, we had great times when I were in Hollywood. Oh, you've been in Hollywood? They wanted me to make some films out there, but I couldn't be doing with all that. Oh, nor I. They want your heart, soul, lungs, liver and lights. Tried to sew me into a contract size of an house brick. Said I'm not signing that. They said you are. I said, I sign that, and first thing, you change my name to Dolores Uji Farnsworth and have me dancing Uchi Koo with Boris Carlo. <laughs> and off they went with their nattering, rabbiting on and on and on. I said, if you can't keep it short, you're jipping me. <laughs> and of course they couldn't keep it short, of course they couldn't. So I was on the first train out of there, Ile de France over the ocean blue, and here I am, ready for out and sticking for now. <laughs> oh, is that Anthony Eden over there? I best go and have a word or there'll be hell to pay if I don't. Back soon. <laughs> oh, great girl, that. Great girl. So, uh, you're a king's counsel, Mr Burkett. I am indeed, Mr Shaw. And isn't it a sign of the times that a man of the law such as yourself can enjoy the fame of a film star like our Gracie or of a literary giant such as myself? A good sign or a bad sign? A sign that the nation's conscience is withering away. If everybody was blessed with a rigorous conscience, every crime would have its confession and we'd have no need of lawyers. <laughs> so, when lawyers grow famous, conscience must be very sick indeed. Do you read a lot of Nietzsche, Mr Burkett? Nietzsche. What? Uh, I think it's pronounced Nietzsche. So it is if you're a German. I'm decent Irish. Nietzsche would describe the very existence of conscience as evidence of the slave morality. The higher man, the superman, has no regard for conscience or convention. In which case, may God preserve us from the higher man. And neither does he have any regard for God. What became of our Gracie? She's surely not left us for good. Uh, no, no, she's over there talking to the gentleman at the piano. Oh, wonderful. Oh, no, she's going to sing. It's called photographic superimposure. Yes. They take a photograph of the skull and place it over a photograph of the victim's head to see if the one corresponds to the other. And this is supposed to be foolproof. Well, they're making great claims. So, if in court I were to take a photograph of Sir Bernard Spilsbury, for example, and superimpose it over the skull of a braying ass, <laughs> this will be accepted as incontrovertible proof of the point I've been making for the past five years. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I had a word with um, Grantham at the Royal College of Surgeons. Mm. He reckons the mutilation would have taken five hours at least. The whole procedure? Scalping them, uh, the facial mutilations, poking their eyes out, slicing their fingers and toes <coughs> up. <coughs> oh, sorry. And the uh, extracting of the teeth. And the whole, the whole while, he's got his three children asleep in the next room. Unless the dissection were performed elsewhere. No, even Glaister acknowledges the dissection had to be done within an hour or so of death. So either he did it there with the children asleep in the next room and the possibility, say, of an emergency patient turning up at his door at any moment... Or they're barking up the wrong tree. He's a civilised man, an intelligent man. You only have to look at him, talk to him. And yet an adulterous wife, in the heat of the moment... You talk to anybody in that town, they'll tell you. His wife gives him the runaround, but he had the patience of a saint. He was more of a father to her than a husband. Looked after her. A thing like this, it's not in his nature. 
There's no shortage of educated murderers gone to the gallows. It's got nothing to do with education. I've sat with murderers who had PhDs from Oxford and Cambridge and a string of letters after their names, but you look in their eyes, you talk to them, don't you? And you know there's something missing. Buck Ruxton's all there. A man of sympathy, a man of understanding, a man of conscience. Do you think he did it? The prosecution case leaks like a colander. Of course. My name is Dr John Glaster. I am the Regis Professor of Forensic Medicine at the University of Glasgow. On the 1st of October 1935, I visited Garden Home Lynn near Moffat, where I collected certain human remains that I subsequently removed to the Department of Anatomy at the University of Edinburgh. I am distributing amongst the members of the jury exhibits 135 to 172, photographs of the remains. Exhibit 135 shows clearly the extent to which the tissue has been removed from the face. It can be seen that the eyes have been removed, the tissues of the nose, the skin of the face and also two central teeth. Beyond prevention of identification, there is one other possible reason for these removals. The portions removed here are parts of the body which might bear signs of asphyxia if death had been so produced. There is no appearance of beard hairs on the face. <clears throat> Exhibit 137 deals with the legs of what we believe to be the same body. A number of vessels were dissected out and their interior examined without disclosing the presence of blood. This meant that blood had been drained entirely from the body after death and, in my view, gives an indication of a relatively short interval of time between death and mutilation. Without commitment, I would say, within a few hours of death. So, to clarify, your view is that the blood was drained from the bodies within a few hours of death and the bodies must have been disarticulated within a few hours of that. That is my view. And would you say this work was performed by a man of medical knowledge? My lord... The mutilation such as I have seen, I consider, would demand some definite anatomical knowledge. On examination of the left big toe in body two, were you able to come to any conclusion? I examined the x-ray photographs taken by Dr Godfrey and I'm of the opinion that there were certain bone changes there, and such bone changes are frequently accompanied by a condition called a bunion. A bunion? Yeah, the joint of the big toe, as can be observed on photograph of exhibit 142, has been removed. The skin and the underlying tissue have been removed down to the bone, exposing the joint cavity between the ball of the great toe and the first metatarsal. In an attempt to disguise the fact that in life, the unfortunate woman suffered from a bunion. Possibly. Did you make a cast of the left foot of each of these bodies? Well, they were made under my supervision. After they were made, that is, exhibits 212 and 213, did you attempt to fit them into certain shoes? Exhibit 212. The plaster cast of the foot of the second body, if I may demonstrate, fits into this shoe. This shoe being Exhibit 84, the shoe previously identified by Mrs Oxley as belonging to Mrs Ruxton. Can we move on now to a photograph of Mrs Ruxton marked A, Exhibit 172? Did you put certain lines on it? I did. This photograph of Mrs Ruxton was enlarged to as near as we could judge life size. And then I superimposed a photograph of the skull of body number two on top, orienting the position as best I could. And what does this demonstrate? It demonstrates, in my opinion, that skull number two might be the skull of Mrs Ruxton. I cannot go further than that. <laughs> and then we come to the age of the deceased. If you would be so good as to remind the court of your findings in that respect for body number two... Somewhere between 35 and 55 years. Somewhere between 35 and 55 years. Hmm. But you are able to be far more specific about the uh, shoe size. I wonder if, again, you would be so kind as to remind the court. Size 5. Established by your touching impersonation of the handsome prince in the tale of Cinderella. My lord! I beg the court's indulgence. Another simple question. I wonder... How many other women in the country wear size five shoes? I don't have that information. Um, an estimate, then. 
I wouldn't hazard a guess. I'm not asking for a professional opinion, just a, a layman's guess. More than a million? Less than five? I wonder, what size does the average shoe shop stock in the greatest abundance? Uh, these are not questions I'm qualified to answer. A glance in my local branch of Freeman, Hardy and Willis convinced me that there's a ready market for the size five. They are a popular line. Let me summarise, then, for, uh, for my own benefit. <laughs> the remains belong, you say, to a woman of indeterminate age, size five shoes, who may or may not have had a bunion. A description that perfectly fits Isabella Ruxton, perhaps, and which, coincidentally, might also fit Miss Amy Johnson, <laughs> Miss Helen Wills Moody, Miss Anna Neagle, Mrs Eleanor Roosevelt, and several million others. <laughs> so perhaps you would illuminate the court on the exact characteristics that cause you to believe that the deceased is indeed Isabella Ruxton and not Mrs Eleanor Roosevelt. My lord, if Mr Birkin will persist Once again, the... my humble apologies, my lord. I should, I know, know better. <laughs> Now, if we could return for a moment to the mystery of the Cyclops Eye. <laughs> oh, one of the court clerks was telling me they haven't had such entertainment round here since the day Heaton Hall got struck by lightning. <laughs> now, there is a limit, though, to the variety of techniques one can employ when shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> I'd say that after the 50th or 60th witness, boredom will begin to set in. Singleton was asleep two minutes into the last cross-examination, and when the judge is asleep, the jury at least falls to daydreaming. Is that in our favour, though, or theirs? Well, theirs, of course. A bored jury is a gift for the prosecution. Up pops a new witness, they're all ears for a moment. The witness makes a few unwarranted assertions. They'll remember those all right. But by the time I come along to challenge those assertions, they're off on their own private islands, ruling the world and winning the pools. Mr Jenkins is grinding the jury down with sheer tedium, I'm afraid, and there's little we can do to stop him. My name is Mary Hampshire, and I've been one of Dr Roxton's patient five years. In your own words, Mrs Hampshire, I wonder if you could describe the events that passed between yourself and Dr Ruxton on the 15th of September of last year. Um, he called at me house to ask me whether I'd go and help him tidy his staircase up, as he'd had to pull up the carpets ready for the decorators coming in the morning, and he needed help with the cleaning. He couldn't do it himself, he said, as he had cut his hand open in a tin of peaches. Did you ask where Mrs Ruxton was? Uh, yeah. He said she were in Blackpool. When you got into the hall, what did you notice with regard to the stairs? Uh, I noticed they were in a very dirty condition... There was straw right up to the top stairs. The doctor showed me how to get hot water from the geezer. In the bathroom, what was the condition of the bath? Well, it were a very dirty yellow right up to about six inches from top. I give the bath a good scrub with hot water and vim, only I couldn't get the stains off. Did you notice the other bedrooms at the top of the stairs? They were locked. I looked for the key as I wanted to get the bits of straw that were sticking from under the doors when I was sweeping up. Did you go into the yard? Yeah. The carpets were there. Two landing carpets and some stair carpets. Was there anything about these carpets? Well, they were stained. One in particular was stained with blood. There were also some blood-stained towels and a shirt half burnt. One carpet were not so bad, just one blood stain, but the other were terrible. I laid it in the yard and threw about 20 or 30 buckets of water on it to try and wash it, but the colour of the water that ran off it were like blood. I had to go at it with a yard brush and water and I still couldn't get the congealed blood off. And the hand, the hand the doctor had cut on the tin of peaches, could you describe the state of the hand? It, it were all bandaged up. There was still blood seeping through the bandages. And how would you assess Dr Ruxton's general state of health? Oh, he, he were poorly all right. Weak as a kitten. I said how ill he looked, and, and he said it were on account of the pain in his hand. Given the appearance of the hand and the doctor's general state of health, could you perhaps estimate the amount of blood he might have lost as a result of his wound? 
I wouldn't know that. What was the doctor's usual appearance and dress? Oh, he, he were extremely smart, always. And on this particular day? He hadn't shaved. He hadn't got a collar and tie on. I'd never seen him in such a state. In your statement, Mrs Hampshire, you say that the prisoner told you on Monday that his wife had gone to London. He had previously told you that she had gone to Blackpool. Did this surprise you? I said to him, I think you're telling me lies, Doctor. He were ever so upset. He said he thought that his wife had gone away with a man. He didn't want anybody to know because of the shame. He were worried about the children. Where were the children at this time? Well, they were staying with a friend. He cried. He laid his head down and he cried. Oh, he were in a terrible way. He's a good man. He's always been a good man. <laughs> Red stains on the carpet. Red stains on the knife. Oh, Doctor Bob Roxton, you murdered your wife. Then <laughs> Mary, she saw you. You thought she would tell. So, Doctor Bob Roxton, you killed her. Only another 15 to go. When we start on the defence witnesses, it'll be downhill all the way, you'll see. I feel as if I've done 12 rounds with Max Schmeling. It's going ever so well, though. Mr Burkitt! Mrs Hampshire! Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is this all right? Speaking to you outside courtroom. Only I thought uh, now I'd finished me bit. It would depend on what... Uh, no, no, that's fine. There was something I wanted to ask you. Of course. It was something I read in paper. About the case? It... Oh, no, nothing to do with that. No, it said in paper about how you met our Gracie. And what I wanted to ask is, in person, is she really like she is in films? Uh, she is a charming and genuine lady, Mrs Hampshire. Oh, I'm ever so glad. Oh, you wait till I tell our Lil. I think Gracie is wonderful, Mr Burkett. So do I, Mrs Hampshire. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I won't keep you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, I think that's my tram. Oh, thanks. Edgar, uh, I got myself all set, sir. I thought Mrs. Hampshire was going to spill the beans with some mighty revelation that gives us a rock-solid defence. And so she has, Edgar. So she has. I want you to stand down all our witnesses. Well, 47? Hmm. Well, some of them are already on the tree. Well, stand them down. Send them home. I don't know. What does that leave us with, sir? What should have been the foundation of our defence all along has twice now been handed to me on a plate and I was too dim to notice. Let me tell you one of the fundamental rules of advocacy. From your Professor of Jurisprudence at Cambridge. From Miss Gracie Fields. The prosecution is nattering, Edgar. They can't keep it short. And why can't they keep it short? The jury must be left in no doubt at all on this point. They can't keep it short because they are jipping us. All they have is smoke screens, wool to pull over our eyes. The worst mistake we could make is to answer their natterin with more natterin. <laughs> Edgar, do you think Dr Ruxton committed this crime? No, I said all along he couldn't have done it. And why could he not have committed this crime? Well, you only have to look at him, not ah. you talk to him. And if you, a man of perspicacity and insight, are so utterly convinced of this man's innocence, then a jury, if astutely guided, will have no choice but to concur. There is our defence, Edgar. No more nattering, no more expert witnesses, no more apodiectics. We will make argumentum ad hominem for once a case for virtue. Stand Ruxton up in court and say, Ecce homo. Is that how Gracie said it? While opening a tin of peaches, I impaled my hand on the spike of the tin opener. The reflex action to move away from the source of the pain caused a further slicing injury from the jagged lid of the tin itself. Hmm. In order to avoid having to take up the court's time by calling it another <laughs> expert medical witness, perhaps you yourself could explain, Dr Ruxton, the effect of such an injury. I had severed the radial artery, which, uh, a characteristic of all arterial wounds, caused an immediate pulsing of blood. I used my right hand to apply pressure to stem the flow, 
and made my way upstairs to the bathroom where I knew I would find what was needed to apply a tourniquet and wash the wound. Is your surgery not in the house? I keep my surgery locked. Extracting the key from my pocket and unlocking a door under the circumstances I knew was quite out of the question. I understand. Please, go on. On the stairs I tripped and fell. I lost my grip with the right hand. The wound began again to bleed copiously. I may have lost consciousness for a moment. And how much blood would you estimate did you lose? It would be impossible to be exact, but from my subsequent weakness and other indicators, it must have been a considerable amount. Enough to make considerable red stains on the carpet. (laughs) Dr Ruxton, if we could for a moment trespass on more intimate matters, we have heard from many, many witnesses that your marriage was not always happy. Would you care to add anything to their exhaustive testimony? I can say honestly that Belle and I were the kind of people who, to use an expression, could not live with each other and could not live without each other. Qui aime bien, châti bien. I wonder, for the benefit of the court... It is a French proverb. Who loves most, chastises most. Ah. I found fault with my wife, but no more than she with me, or any man with any wife who evokes in him the instinct to nurture as well as a grand and glorious passion. My Bella possessed a willful personality, but at her core, it wasn't difficult to discern an awful fragility. You say in your statement, Dr. Ruxton, that your wife was not always faithful. It was an It was an aspect, a a symptom, one might call it, of her fragility, that from time to time she sought reassurance outside the marriage. During the course of your marriage, how frequently had this occurred? Twice, to my knowledge. Perhaps more. And each time, how did you respond? I experienced an overwhelming anguish, Mr. Burkett. A great anguish. And black melancholy. And anger. Anger with your wife? Oh, no, not with her. For the third party in the matter, I often felt anger. I felt anger with myself for my failure, perhaps, to be the husband Belle deserved. I felt anger with her sadness, with her fragility, but not with her. I am a doctor, Mr. Burkett. I can hate the disease, but I am tireless in my care for the patient. Oh, 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 it's absolutely first class. You see, one man speaking. With clear eye and strong voice, the simple, unvarnished truth will carry a jury more surely than a thousand scientists. Or, come to that... 10,000 barristers. You mustn't undervalue your own contribution, Mr. Burkett. (laughs) The police interrogators had such skill twisting my words that I had begun to doubt I even knew what the truth is. But when I speak to you, I feel I'm walking in bright sunlight. One more day in the box, perhaps just a morning, and you will be. I wouldn't be surprised if Singleton didn't throw the whole thing out of court first thing tomorrow. Even with all their photographic superimposures, they've still come up with nothing to prove the bodies are your wife and maid. (laughs) Because they are not. Now, tomorrow, I'd like to make much of the fact that given the so-called evidence of the carpets and so forth, not one of your servants or patients called by the prosecution, not Mrs Oxley, Mrs Hampshire, Mrs Smith, Mrs Kerwin, thought at the time there was a single suspicious circumstance. And why is this? Because... You are an honourable man, a good man, a doctor who commands great respect, a man whose nature could never countenance such a monstrous crime, a man of conscience. Yes, conscience. All we're asking of you, Dr Ruxton, is that tomorrow, just as you did today, you stand in that box and tell the simple, unvarnished truth. The truth. Now, a number of witnesses called by the prosecution have told us that they found you burning items of clothing, towels and so on, in your backyard. Dr Ruxton. Uh, 
this is customary. Every medical practitioner will have cause to dispose of soiled dressings and so on. Burning is the surest way to avoid cross-infection. On the particular week in question, the usual refuse was augmented by the towels and items of clothing soiled by my own injury. But you made no attempt to burn the carpet. I burnt some pieces, but asked Mrs Hampshire whether she wanted the rest. Mrs Hampshire said she tried to clean the blood off the carpet in the yard. She said found... she threw 30 buckets of water on it. Indeed. I would like to know how much blood that would be, and why did she count 30 buckets? But does it follow as a matter of reason? 30 buckets of water and the water just like blood? For heaven's sake, ask yourself, exaggerating things and making mountains out of a molehill. Did she count, may I ask, 30 buckets? It's a fantastic story of a female mind. I understand you're under great strain, Dr Ruxton, but if I Your could take you back... Your duty as a court is to do justice and not put a man to the gallows for nothing. Everyone is against me. Uh, Dr Ruxton, with regard to the... I am on of trial for my life! I have three little mites at home. I have never, ever done anything wrong to anybody who did not deserve it. It is all an exaggeration. Could you tell us about the suit which you gave away to Mrs Hampshire for her May husband? I say Do one word? If you could listen to the question, Dr Ruxton... Does my I'm learned friend know anything about the life of a medical man? About the everyday decisions concerning life and death? Just attend to me for it a minute, Doctor. It is a Don disgrace. It is a reflection on my professional capabilities. Can you not? Can you not see how I am feeling, Doctor Ruxton? Everyone is cornering me and and, and 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 trying to just get me into a corner about about my bell, about what I did to my bell. Here it is, front page of the News of the World. I killed Mrs. Ruxton in a fit of temper because I thought she had been with a man. I was mad at the time. Mary Rogerson was present. I had to kill her. Remarkable. You were so sure. Yes. You know, what vexes me most is that the papers are presenting the whole thing as a triumph of forensic pathology. The conviction had nothing to do with forensic pathology. He practically confessed in the witness box. He could have walked free. The prosecution case was a nonsense. There was not a spot of blood in his car. There was nothing to place him in Scotland. He stood in that witness box, steady and true and calm. Until his conscience got the better of him. If it's a triumph of anything, it's a triumph of the human conscience. And now the law, quite without conscience, has hanged him. He did kill and mutilate his wife and maid. He would never have killed again, though, and, and if he had walked free, he would have gone back to his practice and saved hundreds of lives. In a world where conscience is sick, he was a man of conscience. What should we do with the fish knives? Oh, yes, I've been giving it some thought. He wanted to give you a gift, I suppose, mm. for the trouble he put you to in court, mm. like the Jeroboam of champagne that Ericsson sent you. Mm. Yes, except Ericsson was acquitted. I've never known it from a hanged man before. Conscience again. He lied to you. Another little act of atonement. Yes. We do already have a set of fish knives. And I think perhaps my Dover soul would taste odd if I were to use a knife given to us by a man who cut his wife up into little pieces. Yes. I'll give them to Edgar. In Burkitt and the Red Stains on the Carpet by Caroline and David Stafford, Norman Burkitt was played by Neil Dudgeon, Buck Ruxton by Saga Aria, Edgar, Alan Raglan, and Billy by Bonnie Engstrom. Glaister was James Laley, Jackson, Adam Billington, Mary, Alex Rivers, Gracie Fields, Victoria Inez Hardy, Bernard Shaw, Gerard McDermott, Bennett, Ricky Lawton, and Alfred was Christopher Webster. The director was Mark Beebe. <laughs>